Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor. I'm just looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, then I think you're going to like what we do here. My guest today is E.B. Tucker, author of The Tucker Letter. EBTucker.com, phenomenal letter. He publishes bi-weekly. I never miss it. I love EB's writing and it's always great catching up with him. Big announcement. The Commodity University is now live for any aspiring commodity investors. If you want to understand the fundamentals behind the commodities industry, beginning with the most basic of principles and definitions like what is a commodity, leading you all the way through to portfolio construction, check out thecommodityuniversity.com. We just finished this course. I am so jacked on this. I love how it came together and I'm really excited to share this with you guys, thecommodityuniversity.com. I think this decade will be defined by rising commodity prices and scarcity as we enter the new era of deglobalization, but that's just what I think. Anyways, love for you to check that out. And here is E.B. Tucker. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with E.B. Tucker. E.B., it's great to have you back on the show, buddy. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Let's, uh, there's a handful of things I want to run through today. Uh, first of all, I got to ask about the coffee on your desk there. You were sharing a bit of background on the unique fermentation process behind this, and I was very curious. Yeah, yeah. So I've been writing about this in my newsletter, ebtucker.com. I'm writing about, um, you know, after the financial stuff, I write about life stuff, and, and I'm very into coffee, which people know. And uh, what's happening in coffee right now is what happened to microbrewed beer about 15 years ago. Remember, if you're if you're old enough to know this, there wasn't really that much beer to drink. You know, 25 years ago, you had like Heineken was kind of like the most exotic beer that you, you would get, you know, in the U.S. And yeah. then it, all of a sudden, these breweries started popping up everywhere. And now you can actually like take a vacation and go to breweries. So 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 coffee is going through a similar kind of renaissance. And what's driving this movement is there's been experimentation in how to process the coffee beans. And so what they're doing is they come up with all these ways to process the coffee bean to pull pretty exotic flavor combinations. And I don't mean added flavor. This is just kind of like naturally, you know, creating a, something, a different variation with the bean. So right now I'm having this, this is called a uh, peach syrup co-ferment, Rodrigo Sanchez. This is a, I, I, I think the best coffees are coming out of Colombia and Panama um, mostly because they have small lot producers, whereas like Brazil and parts of Africa, they produce in co-ops. So you get very nice beans, but you yes. can't isolate, you know, one little bean. And so what these guys do is they take the coffee and then they ferment the coffee cherry, um, you know, with various types of yeast in a zero oxygen environment. And you can get this stuff. And I'm telling you, I, I don't want to get too deep in the woods here, but let me tell you something. You can get ultra premium coffee. This is from Brandywine Coffee in Delaware. I have a link to this in my newsletter. Ultra premium coffee, when you do the math on it, it's about $1.75 a cup. Okay. I mean, I don't know of anything else that can change your personal time. Like your your you know, this is my office, right? So like I do a lot of things in this office. I write books in here, I, I read, I think about things, I make big decisions. And I just love time in my office. And so when you sit down with a premium cup of coffee and I'm thinking everybody wants like a fancy watch or a car or something, $1.75, change your whole day. So anyways, that's what I'm drinking right now. And I just brewed that. And so you and I virtually are enjoying a cup of coffee together. I like it, man. You know what? Your, your comments in your office, they resonate. And last time I had you on the show, you made some comments about real estate and you're like, it's very important to live in a cool house. Not a big house, not an expensive house. You got to live in a cool house because it inspires creativity. And I took that to the bank, man. And I have my office here. It's like a living room out there, my studio in here. And and uh, I just redesigned my space because I get lazy with design. Like I will not put any effort in. I just put things where they land, et cetera. But I'm also very impacted by my environment, right? And so when I consciously change it, right, in a way that suits me and inspires me, everything changes, everything changes, like the quality of my writing, the quality of my work, my best yep. ideas, all this stuff. Okay, so just yep. on the on the concept of fermented coffee, have you ever had Luwak coffee? I was in Indonesia last year, this is like the, the, the they call it the monkey poo coffee, it's actually a cat that yep. eats the coffee cherry, and then ferments in the belly, they, they poo it out. Very interesting. Yep. I've heard curious. about this. 
how uh, yep, how anybody landed on, on that as a harvest technique yeah. for, for you gotta coffee. wonder you gotta wonder the person that discovered it you really gotta wonder about that person but <laughs> yeah. but see it's so fun because the coffee people don't understand this but the coffee bean is about it's a fruit right so there's a cherry around it and and the coffee bean is about 50 percent of that cherry and then there's just fruit and pulp and so what happens is, is you however you ferment or get rid of that they used to just put it out on concrete let the sun dehydrate it and then you you know take off the the shell once it's dehydrated okay basically you see these coffee husks and that's a good way to do it you know but but your way for an animal to ingest it run through the gi tract and ferment in there that's pretty radical but the coffee Coffee bean is a bit porous. It absorbs a lot of those things. So anyway, so I don't want to get people too distracted, but but in my yeah. newsletter, I did two-part series where I explained why I drink coffee and how I make the coffee, where I get it and everything. And people can read that at ebtucker.com. But I want to get back to your housing comment because, Jay, I think the Fed ruined housing, okay? And and I'm writing about this. I don't want to give too much away, but I think that that what happened was you lost all your craftsmen, you know, you lost all people that make things with their hands in the Western economies. Now, if you go to certain developing economies, you'll find people that are stone workers. They work with wood. They do all these different things. And that's their craft. I mean, I was in Japan this summer. It's unbelievable the amount of care. And, and um, I mean, Japan is developed. I'm not trying to characterize it as developing. But but people in Japan, they won't build anything unless it's well thought out and, and everything has a purpose. And in the U.S., uh, the only purpose is to borrow and spend as much as possible and to consume. And so what you end up with is my experience in the U.S. is very hard to live in the U.S. Um, and have a quality of life that's that's suitable as far as I'm concerned, because you can't find anyone to build you a place. And what happens is the builder tells you what you're going to get. Well, the builder says to you, um, OK, look, I'm going to give you a 6,000 foot box. Everybody's going to get a little tiny window. And it's going to have a couple of bonus rooms and it's going to have a bunch of LED lights. And it's, it's going to be this cavernous, depressing place that you can just kind of like sit in and wonder why you're not happy. And the reason why the builder has that power is because the builder can't make money by building things that take time to build. I mean, they need to build you a bonus room because the, the kitchen is expensive. The bathroom is expensive. But the bonus room is just like this cavernous space. And they charge kind of the same per square foot, and that's where they get their profit margin. So it's very, very difficult if you want to build a space that is a quality design. So slowly, I'm going to explain what that means to people in the newsletter. Is that you? You really, it's 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 kind of like a thing that you have to put a lot of purpose into. And what you start figuring out is that the you're against the tidal wave. You know, the tidal wave is the Fed's. The Fed decided that if everybody's house like levitates in value, people will be happy. They'll feel rich, you know. So, so you you created these weird incentives and um, things like in in Florida, terrazzo, which is a a beautiful concrete and glass kind of um, uh, flooring product that we used to use in the fifties all the time. It was very cheap. All the terrazzo people died and they went away. And so now terrazzo is like super expensive because you only have a few custom people that'll do it. And so people say, no, no, don't use that. We're going to use a laminated flooring or something in here it's ridiculous and laminated flooring it, it looks like wood but it's not wood the whole thing is crazy and i'm telling you it's a nightmare to get yourself a spit but it's a worthwhile effort because like you were saying uh, my where i live my primary residence is only like um i don't know how big it is it's it's less than two thousand feet and and people are always stunned by that they're like why why i think you live in a well i just got a wall around it okay it has every piece of the space is thought out. You know, there's two structures. So you you intermix between the two structures. It's very, very cool. Now, when people come visit me, Jay, they come and stay for the weekend or something. They're just like, I feel like I'm in some other place. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I feel like I am. Maybe I'm in coastal Portugal or something. I have no idea. But I've kind of lost myself. And, and I'm like, that's what we're going for. Because as you know, you know, there's a right brain and a left brain. And in our, you know, and it was some of us use the left a lot, and some of us use the right. And you and I use both, and so we need these analytical spaces, and then we need spaces that allow us to to feel. And people in the U.S. don't appreciate the value of of feel, like your space, your friends, the things that you do, all are connecting with your body, like as an energetic 
in an energetic way. And it's a huge deal. And so people, you can't fix this in a day. Okay. It takes, it's a journey. And that's what we're going to talk about in the letters because you just kind of get on the path and it's, it's slow and steady. You don't like paint your front door red. It's not good design. You know, good design is making a space that you, that you live in that fits your personality. hundred percent, man. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. I want to, there's two threads I want to pull on there. One is, is related to the housing market and maybe we'll go there first. And the second relates to your more recent newsletter. So I'll ask the housing question first, because I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. Given there's no national housing market, as far as I understand, they're all pretty local and how they perform and, and volatile, independent of each other. You know, if you're looking at like in, in Canada, like Vancouver versus Edmonton, for example, or, you know, it's the same in the States. Look at Austin, Texas versus uh, Boise, Idaho. But um, there's a lot of doom and gloom around the housing market right now. I, I understand it, right? People are usually buy houses they can barely afford. Just as a general ru rule, they seem to do that. Now the rates have gone up. They can't afford these houses. And we're looking at maybe some, some issues there. Um, <clears throat> general liquidity squeezes are occurring, you know, like uh, credit applications are being rejected at record rates. Credit card delinquencies are climbing pretty high. Auto loan delinquencies. We know all this data. It's a dire outlook. And that could lead you to believe that the housing market's going to get whacked a little bit. And maybe you should be a bit cautious there. Now, I hear that, but I have to acknowledge that I've heard that, right, for decade upon decade upon decade. And in an area close to where I live, Vancouver, British Columbia, I've seen headlines about the housing boom about to crash. I can find headlines from the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, et cetera. And if your time horizon is long enough to weather whatever near-term volatility, so it seems like you're fairly still, still a good bet. My concern, though, is like, what if we are in the new era of rates? And I had Jim Grant on my program a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, people think so short term, what they fail to acknowledge is that rates actually move in like generational cycles. So they go up for about 40 years, they go down for about 40 years. And you can see this from roughly 1940 to 1980, rates more or less went up, volatility, but they went up in 1980 to 2020, give or take a couple of years, they fell, Vol volatility, but they fell. And so in a rising rate environment, you know, multi-decade is, you know, does that compromise my thesis on housing that if you can weather the short-term volatility, maintain your time horizon, the net asset value will still go up? What do you think about that? What's your take, Evie? Well, it's just super complicated. I mean, you, you, you don't actually make money on real estate. It's a delusion because what happens is the nominal value in, increases over time. And there are periods where there's excess liquidity coming in, meaning, you know, you can borrow at 2.9% for 30 years, which is a bit crazy. And, and so people do that, you know, they respond accordingly. I mean, if I ring the bell that, you know, happy hour ends in 10 minutes, you know, everybody's got two drinks, right? So, so, so this, you know, pushes things up, then you, you go through this radical interest rate period, which we should talk about separately from the housing thing. And because there's some pieces there, people need to understand. And then what does everybody do? They freeze in place, you know, like a uh, freeze dance, you know, that nobody's moving. And so they're not going to, they're not going to move. And uh, now you're just down to people that have to move for work or, you know, all these different things. Now, the reason why I'm not qualified to advise on this is because I have a radically different philosophy of, I see a house as a consumption item. So I, 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 I can't get a loan, you know, because uh, I don't really have a job. If I go into the bank, they don't really understand what's going on. And um, so I can't get a loan. And so I've always had to buy. Well, not always. I mean, I, I did have a loan once, you know, a long time ago, but I, I, I can't buy. I have to buy a house with cash. You know, so you have to. So what that means is I have to buy a house I can afford. It's unbelievable discipline. I mean, you, you go and you say, well, what's on the market? You know, and what's your budget? And Zillow says, well, you could buy a house seven times that much, you know? <laughs> so like, uh, we'll, we'll introduce you to the mortgage broker. But anyway, but I can't do that. So so I've always decided this is where I want to be. And I don't think you make money, make money on the house. I mean, I think like the real estate market is not going to crash. I, I don't think it's like that. I mean, the reason why you had a big crash in 08, which by the way, I, I bet my life savings on rental property. We've talked about that before after this. I know a lot about this. Is because you had people that were taking these signature loans to buy five places. And this built up over a long time. 2006, I was in the car 
with a guy that was the the managing director of Morgan Stanley for Alabama to Naples, Florida, seventeen billion at the time under management. It's much more now. And he was telling me that he was getting these deals out of Orlando where he was like putting fifty grand down for this condo and then selling it before it was even built. And you know, young EB's mind was like, how does that even work? You know, I mean, it's so crazy. I mean, like, you mean you don't even live in the thing? So anyway, so this went on for a few years before there was an actual problem. You know, before it was like the exotic dancer in Miami had to be like, I, I actually own seven houses. Like, I'm not sure. I guess I should sell them, you know, and everybody goes to sell them. You know the story. So I think I think what I try to encourage people to do is to is to realize that the, that the Fed wants your house to slowly levitate in value. And if you look at the over the course of your life, like, for instance, a, a, a nice house. Uh, to live like an average ranch house, like a three, two or something like one story probably costs, depending on where you live, but like, at least like in Florida, for example, you know, 150 grand in 2000 or like 125 grand in 2000, if that same house in that neighborhood right now costs probably 600 grand. So, you know, it went up four or five times. Well, what did gold cost back then? Well, it cost like 350 or something. I don't know, something like that. Pick, pick the date. What does it cost now? I don't know, like 18 something. Wow. I mean, this is magic. It's about the same amount. So you see that like, you know, you don't really want to see your house as like this thing that's like a, that's like a, and people use it as forced savings and they pay down the more. It's just kind of stupid, you know, but you just do what you got to do, but pick a place that's cool and don't worry about making money. Just be like, this is where we live. You know, we, we, we exist in this space. Our children are, are going to grow up here. Our family comes to visit here. We're going to make career decisions here. We might die here. You know, this is this is not really like a trade. You know, we're not trying to like make a bunch of pile. Because then if you sell it, you got to go buy another house. It's totally like uh, circular, you know, the whole thing. So, I mean, I think you look at it as like, it's nice to own a house. I don't think you really time the market. You find a house that you like and you can afford and you live in it. And um, yeah, over time, it'll probably it'll probably nominally inflate, you know, but, but I don't think it, you know, becomes something that's like rises drastically in value because it pretty much is going to always cost about the cost to make another one. That's pretty much what it should cost, you know? And so the house slowly falls apart. I mean, if you've owned a lot of real estate, you know, that it falls apart at about a two and a half, three percent rate per year. You know, if you, if you go like 30 or 40 years, you've almost rebuilt the house. You've done roof, plumbing, electrical you've done all these things to it you know so you so you that's how i see it but look you don't want to tell that to real estate agents because they they'll advise you to do all kinds of other crazy things but um it's in their best interest that you do those crazy things i publish a weekly newsletter every sunday if you would like to subscribe hit the link right beneath this video now i'm an investor but i don't write about managing money i write about managing my mind without question the hardest and most important part of allocating capital through volatility and getting some back. If you wanna read my newsletter, hit the link right beneath this video. I know you'll love it. Now back to the interview, enjoy. Yeah, I wonder if that rate of depreciation or disrepair has increased. I mean, I feel like it must have, right? Like the the house that I live in. Definitely. Yeah, I just, I feel like the houses that I'm walking through today, new builds, you can just feel how cheaply made they are. They don't age well, they don't age well. That's yeah. right. They don't age well. The, the stuff peels off the side. It falls off. It's glued together. Um, it's very cheap. They don't age well. Whereas if you get into these, I like houses from the 50s. I mean, they, you know, they for some reason, the 50s was this era between plaster and drywall where they had this like, they're like, let's just put like a ton of concrete with like mesh. And I don't know what they were thinking, but I mean, it's like a bomb shelter, you know, so you have to use like a hammer drill to hang pictures, you know, in my house. And I'm thinking like, imagine trying to build that now. Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah. impossible. I mean, they, they, these builders in Florida, they're, they're first of all, they're, most of them are like convicted felons, but they'll take like, they'll be like, yeah, let's put some stone up there. And I'll be like, stone. I mean, that's not, that's not even a building material that's local to Florida, right? That's like from Connecticut. And he's like, yeah, yeah well, we just put like uh, what looks like stone and like nail it up. It's like, it's crazy. It's like a Hollywood set. Yeah, right. It's the true. Whole thing, the whole thing is common. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I have a ton to say about this. And so I don't want to, you know, chew up any more of our time, but I have books and like experience and I visited, I mean, I I rented a Frank Lloyd Wright house once and stayed in it for one night. I mean, I've been, I've, I pretty much will go see any 
weird space. It, you can, you tell me about some, you know, house hanging over a cliff somewhere and I'm going to go, you know, take a tour of, I mean, I've been doing this for years and it's so much fun. I love, I love that, you know, and, and yeah, you know, Randy Smallwood, the CEO of Wheat and Precious Metals lives in like an 80 year old heritage home in downtown Vancouver. And, uh, you know, that compared to my house, I have a great house, but I feel like I could push my house over compared to his house. Like when I yeah consider it. All right. So, so then backing up to the newsletter, recent edition, you know, great, great writing as always EB. And you walk the reader through a story of starting out on the Minneapolis light rail, almost getting shanked, ending up at the Dharma meditation center and having a revelation there about how we interpret past bull markets and how that sort of dictates our future behavior. So what can you share on, on that story with my audience? Well, everybody I've told the Minneapolis thing to has, that's been there has responded that they had a similar experience. It's so funny. Um, you know, so if you visit Minneapolis, I mean, depending on your appetite for risk, you either do or do not try the try the light rail. But, um, you know, we've written about so many things this year. Like, for instance, uh, you know, we wrote about draining the pool and people people didn't understand what we're talking about. We're trying to explain that, like, the Fed's trying to trying to drain the pool. Right. So when they're draining the pool, you know, be careful over there in the shallow end. Right. Like. They're pulling water out of this thing. You know, that that means you. OK, so it really means me, too. I mean, it's like it's it's it, it's it means us. I mean, we're not multi-billion dollar private lenders here. Right. I mean, we're you know, we're 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 like um, doing pretty well. But I mean, we have to be aware of these things. And and, uh, and so we did that. And then we we talked about how they're going to raise rates till something breaks. And, and um, you know, then we talked about how the, the debt ceilings and the shutdowns don't really matter you know they just because things going to keep and so you what you what the whole message the whole time from the beginning was you got the trustee and you got the gambler you got these two pieces of your brain right and and you want to gamble because you just came out of a gambling period but it's not a good time to gamble it's like it's a terrible time to gamble you want to gamble when they're putting water into the pool okay so when I mean, they're pulling water out of the pool you don't want to gamble at all you want to buy stuff like one of our stocks in the trustee portfolio uh, yesterday was the best performing stock in the S&P. And, you know, I was trying to explain to people earlier this month that I, I, I'm not very optimistic about this company. And they say, well, what do you mean? Are you, you going to sell it? No, I'm not going to sell it. What I'm saying is that the sector where they are an excellent producer in is seeing less customers right now because the, the type of customer they cater to is, is having to, to consume less of this product. It's just a fact, but these guys are so good. You know, there's the, the reason why they're the best performers. They came out with earnings, and they're like, "Yeah, I mean, volumes aren't great, but we 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 made a lot of money, and we you know we we think volumes are a little better than people realize." You know, so I'm trying to explain to the readers that like that's a trustee mentality. I don't really care if I have a, a 10% drawdown or something because this is a dominant force in this industry that that is something that people will not live without they just have to do a little less okay so but the problem is is that the, the gamblers were coming out of the 2021 bull market and so they have a bias towards what just happened so whatever just happened you want to do that more because you you just came through that and so and, and the problem is is that is that nobody stops and sits and and just waits I mean, what's been the move this year? The move has been to own T-bills, uh, to to occasionally buy a, a stock of a company that you're very happy with. Like if you if you were to have a, term, a tumultuous time in the market, you, you're you're not upset, okay? And, and you're happy to own that. You know, like the if that business was privately owned, you wouldn't be freaking out. You know, if the where you'd say, this is, a, I, I'm a dominant force in this business. I'm happy to own this. So that's been the move, you know? I mean, that's what we've done. And people are, people are bothering me and like saying, you know, I, I need something to, to bet on. It's like, it's not the time. Yeah. It's not the time yeah. to do that. And so now I do, I just want to tell you something. I didn't, you know, I don't know if you're expecting this, but I got to tell you, I do think I know what happens, like how this happens. Okay. How this changes. Okay. And, and I think, what the Fed is doing is they're they're draining the pool to pull the size of their balance sheet down as much as they can until they break something. And we talked about this before. Now, when they break something, okay, 
What does that mean? Well, that means that you, you know, you had bank failures, not that big of a deal. They pushed a little money in, everything's sorted out. Uh, you've had some small failures, but nobody cares about that because those people aren't, nobody knows about those people, right? Nobody cares about student loan people because they don't have a loud enough microphone. You get what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, okay, so what has to happen? Well, you got to get into a crunch where, where something big happens, like a big mortgage originator, or I'm just giving you like some, just some, some generalized ideas, like something that affects a mass amount of people. Boom, it hits a wall, okay? When the Fed steps back in, what I think they want to do, see, right now you have this big problem where to borrow for a month costs the, the Treasury like 5.5%. I mean, the portfolio, we're in T-bills, we explained to people how to do it, 5.5%. That's pretty good. You know, that, that's like, that's pretty amazing. If you're, if you got a million bucks sitting there liquid and you put it in there, I mean, you're talking about like 50 grand a year, U.S. government, U.S. government ain't failing, okay? They got, they got a, you know, 12 or 13 nuclear carrier groups, all right? They ain't, these guys, they're not failing, all right? They, they, things might not look great down the road, but failure is not something to expect. But now you look at the 10-year, and the 10-year was like in the threes, right? So you have like five here and then three. Now, 10 years now well into the fours, but it's, come, it's coming up, okay? So this is going to keep coming up. So, it's, so, so the front rate was five and the back rate was three. Now that's upside down. That's upside down. Now, now it's coming up. We're in a recession right now. We're in a recession. Period. Like, forget about the headlines. We're in a recession now. Go do some anecdotal, you know, research yeah. on your own. We're in the recession. It's happening. Okay. Ten year goes up like this. Well, now you have five here, and and then you have like say five and a half, ten. So now you got a little slope. Fed likes that. They like that slope. They want it to cost more to borrow for a long time. Than it does for a short time, and then once you get there and you have you have a crisis, you know something, boom, they're going to adjust the front down and make a nice slope. Okay, so we're going to write about this next week. I don't want to spoil this, but 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 that's what they want. Okay, and, and 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 this is called yield curve control, and and when they do this, um, I think you're going to pivot in the in the markets, especially the markets that we watch. I think I think I think people are going to kind of like say, whoa, wait a second, what are the implications of this? Because you never can stop doing that. It's like, it's like, it's like having a well-managed professional heroin addiction. You cannot, you, once you're on that road, you're now you're in management, constant management, right? You can't, you know, there is no like go back to normal homeostasis. Can't do that. You know, like even when we started all this stuff 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it's a one-way street. You never go back. The debt's never going down. Forget about it. The, the budget deficit in the U.S., $2 trillion, never going down. Forget about it. Maybe it's going to get a little smaller. Maybe it's going to go from $2 trillion to $1 trillion. Maybe it even can go to $500 billion, but it's never, going, it's never going the other direction. The question is they want to control that pile. So they want to, they want to control that pile so that they have the reins of capitalism. All right. That's what these guys want to do. Now, forget about asking me, like, can they do it or not? I, I, who knows? But that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. And so what I would watch is is that is that 10 year to start coming up, you know, above the, the, the front rate. Now, I know that might be a lot for people. So we're going to explain it this week in terms that everyone can understand, because economics is not complicated. It's just that people aren't good at explaining it. That's that's the that's the the issue, and and that's our job is to say like you can do this. It's not that complicated. Believe me. Like this is um, you got this. I like that man. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it, and I think you're right. There's a lot of this uh, subject matter is not nearly as complex as it's made out to be. But there's something very intimidating about finance and economics and markets, and people don't want to ask simple questions for. You know they don't want to look dumb or whatever, whatever it is. You know, but uh, it's uh, it's not it's not taught in schools. We know that much. You can go to thirteen years of public school education, never learn what credit or interest rates are, or capital gains, or you know yield curve control to say the least. Um, but uh, okay, so so if, if that's what to watch, EB, you said in response to a rising ten year and that nice slope, you know, short term money being cheaper than long term money. What's the pivot? Because you mentioned this will be the time where the market says maybe it's time to pivot. And talk to me about the pivot. Yeah. 
Well, I think I think people don't think it's possible that you know we could have a, a fixed. That means that buyers and sellers and lenders and borrowers aren't setting the interest rates anymore. I mean, you can't fix you can't fix anything in life. I mean, imagine you you know try to keep your partner from ever changing their style or something, right? It's like you can't. This is a it's biological. I mean, it's, it's always changing. And the thing about capitalism that we always taught people was that what makes it great is that you have millions of buyers and sellers determining the price of everything. But it's not true. You have one guy named Jerome and another, you know, dozen or two people that do what Jerome says or else they get thrown off the board setting the price. And I think I think people have struggled to to understand this. And um, it doesn't mean the system blows up. It doesn't mean any of these crazy anybody giving you these crazy things. Just like listen to them, put them on the shelf, and say, "I'll think about it." Right? It's like usually you don't end up with like mushroom cloud over the debt markets. It's not really like that. It's just that you enter a new paradigm, and and in this new paradigm, you know, people start realizing like wait a second i mean you know i don't know if i want to own those things or at least maybe i don't want to own but half of them you know and they start making moves and um and i think that there have been stuff that drops on your foot and hurts has suffered a lot um recently and in, in the you know the shift in short-term interest rates I, mean, I think it's a big deal and i think that that when you switch you know you realize that like getting the stuff we need is going to be hard and what do we do, you know, and all these, you know, and I, and I watch this on here, right? So like basically on here, you know, people need to know that like there's stuff happening on here that you don't hear about for a couple of months. I mean, one of the things happening right now is there's a lot of funds launching to bet on, you know, rising cost of commodities and all this. Stuff. And I mean, I'm talking about like people in New York that you would not expect okay. to make those bets. All right. And so yeah. these guys are early, they're early, they're smart, you know, they, they, they don't do something that you would think it's not, they don't, they don't buy stocks. Um, but they're playing what they're playing for, I think is going to benefit certain parts of the market. And, um, but look, that stuff is slow. I mean, I mean, I, the number one thing I, I try to explain to people, I don't think they listen is that, is that you, this is not a, a get rich quick scheme. I mean, getting rich is a marathon. It's a, it's a marathon. I mean, if, if, you know, if you got one hot stock that changes your life, you just got very lucky. Yeah. And you should behave accordingly. What that means is that you should buy something totally boring, you know, like, like a, something that is non-correlated, you know, because the odds of you doing that again are, are pretty slim. You know, you, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, getting rich is a marathon. Staying rich is even harder. <laughs> yeah, it is. It if, is. You, if you pick it that is. hot stock, your, your odds of giving all that back. It are, is. Super, super yeah. high. And just so you know, if you're watching this video, you're rich because what it means is, is that there's a hierarchy of needs in life and you have gone past having to break rocks, you know, all day and you've gone all the way up to being able to watch YouTube. <laughs> that that point, means man. that you, you have time to invest in yourself. So stop thinking that you've missed out and it's not fair and all these different, it's nonsense. Like yeah. if you have time to educate yourself and to learn about something, and to and to try new things and to ponder your next move, you are a long way past trying to find something to eat. I mean, I I, oh, yeah. I, I think people people they they really have a bad perspective with that. You know, they they because what happens they get into this like I don't have enough and somebody has more than me and it's totally nonsense. The people that succeed in the long run are the people that think very differently. They're like it doesn't matter what kind of race you're running. I mean, it doesn't matter. It matters yeah, what kind of race I'm running. You Dude, know what I mean? Hundred percent. Yeah. And and patience is the most undervalued trait uh, in for investors. I don't know, maybe for in general, you know, in general. But because um, you're right, it's a marathon, and I, I always I always think about the fact that success comes inch by inch, like progress comes inch by inch. You know, it's a slow incremental process that compounds over time if you stick with it. Right. And that's when, yeah, that's when you get the, well, beta. you need balance too, right? You need balance. 
you need balance because you gotta you gotta you know like the guy that takes care of my property like is a he he'll probably be watching this so i don't want to embarrass him but he but he's always asking me for for a um something he can learn like a like a podcast all these things and so i told him recently to listen to a fish concert uh, yeah. and he's like well what am i going to learn doing that and i'm like i'll tell you what you're going to what's going to happen is you need to occasionally jam out a little bit <laughs> because if you're at the gym 24 7 your 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 joints fall apart yeah 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 so you, you know it's about balance right i mean like you you got to do a little learning you got to do a little enjoying you know, and we, we talk about that in the letter. It's like people have a really hard time with that. You know, they're, they're like, well, I can't enjoy like you can. I'm like, no way, man. I could think of a dozen things you could do right now to, to, to get out of your head and do something super fun. You know, like we were talking about the coffee. I mean, this is like $1.75. It's a game changer, man. I mean, you read about how they made this stuff and it takes you on a whole trip. You know, you're like, this is crazy. I can't believe they, they, they made it taste like peach. Right. You know, it's just nuts. I mean, so, but what I'm saying is, is that these are, these things are important. You know, you, you sit in the coffee shop all week and you don't get anything done. Right. So it's like balance over the long run is I think what you find leads to the most amount of success. You know, when you meet successful people, you watch their habits, you know, the guys that are guys and girls that are up at, three o'clock in the morning working, they, they usually die of a heart attack or something. So, I mean, you know, you go, you want balance. So on that chart behind you that you referenced, you're like, you know, there's some data here that we don't realize for a while. Essentially you're, you're seeing people chase you, as you said, getting the stuff we need is going to be increasingly hard into the future. And I think that, you know, one of the hottest charts right now is the live cattle futures chart over the last three years. It's just, straight up into the right. And I kind of feel like that's going to define this decade. The value of supply chains is going way up and therefore the value of the raw materials is going way up. And so, you know, is that part of the pivot that you would expect? We've seen this 12-ish year trend of, of chucking money at speculative growth stocks right now, something like, uh, what is it? Four companies, five companies make up 24% of the value of the S&P. That's that's record. Yeah, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Alphabet. Yes, twenty four percent of the total market value of the S and P. Um, that usually ends badly. It's happened before, not to that extent, but it usually ends badly. But you know, is this part of the pivot that you see back to a, a more value driven investor mindset? Yeah, I mean the the the, the stocks that that make stuff got punished. So yeah. what happened? So it's very it's very complicated. The the when the money was free, you could make a fifty year bet on growth, and it costs nothing. So I don't know anybody out there that went to any sort of finance school. You know, they made these like net present value tables. So you're like, what's the value of a dollar in twenty years? You know, well it depends on the interest rate. I mean, if the interest rate is zero, you know, it's one value. If interest rate's ten then the value of the dollar is like a penny, you know, cause you're like, I mean, you'll, you'll, you know, you need 10% for 20 years. You'll have more than a dollar. So, so this, this it changes all the time. Now what happened was we just lived through this era where you could just, you could just have like, we're, we'll be profitable in a hundred years. Okay. You know, here's, here's some money. And, uh, and that's finishing. So people don't understand the, the, these big tech stocks, they don't like necessarily crash and go away or something. What, it's like IBM. IBM was was like an amazing stock, right? And now it's just like a it's like the most basic average boring stock out there. It still employs like tons of people, right? And and it pays a dividend and you know, it's just all this stuff, but like it doesn't do anything. And and so I, I this week I was in New York and I went to hear David Einhorn talk. It was very interesting. You know, he, he actually just read a speech. It was very flat, but He's a really smart guy, and he was talking about when he bought Apple, it was the best performing stock that, that he bought. You know, and, and when he bought it, it was growing. You know, it was like a um, PE of between six and ten. You know, varied, and it was growing at like twenty five percent compounded average. And then we sold it. It was a PE of like twenty nine, and it was growing at zero. So, the company, everybody's got this like dramatic thing of like you're gonna. It's going to crash. I mean, it's like not that often that something, you know, that's like $2 trillion like crashes. It's kind of a crazy notion to think about. But but it certainly could grow at 0% for a while. 
I mean, you know, it's just, it's just kind of like, well, do you want to own that business? You know, like, like the, the company you were talking about earlier in the newsletter portfolio is growing. I mean, it's like, you know, it's growing, but, but the market hasn't really been excited about that because, you know, they have facilities and, and so anything that was old economy, you know, that, that was like that made stuff, we got punished. Like anything that was value oriented, quote unquote, got punished. It traded at very low PE. Anything that that had a future potential trade at very high PE. So this is all shifting right now because the the interest rates shot from zero to five and a half overnight. So all all this stuff all this stuff changed, and 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 I think it's going to change again. You know, because because the reason why they had to shoot it straight up is because if you did it over a long period of time, you'd bankrupt the world. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so you have where- all these all these people now are waiting to refinance. You know, how many people do you know? They're like, I'm not moving. I'm oh, not yeah. moving. A lot. Because I got this mortgage. Well, it's companies are doing that too, right? They're like, oh, we have bonds coming due next year. Let's wait till the spring. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Absolutely. So where do you land it then in the in the higher for longer versus near term pivot camp EB? Do you have any I I, 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 th- I think what, what happens is as soon as the 10 year, you know, crosses up over the short term, they'll they'll start to they'll start to arrange it to where it's in a line. Okay. And I would think that that's probably like first half of next year, you, you got this line and, 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 you know, cost more to borrow money for longer periods of time, which makes sense, right? I mean, how, how on earth could it cost five and a half percent to borrow for a month and 3% to borrow for three decades? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You don't have to have been to any school at all to know that that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's that's a that's good perspective. Yeah. Good perspective. Okay, um, where else are you looking in the market for opportunity right now? Are you seeing anything? Well, I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm I don't want to say I'm not doing a lot because I'm always doing something. But what I've been focused on this year is is has worked really well. You know, I mean, it's been it's been um, you know the energy space so easy, so easy. I mean, like the. You know, we bought the biggest refiner in the U.S. And sure enough, no diesel. You know, it's like it's like yeah. there's no yeah. refinery younger, younger than 40 years old. And if you're 40, you know, there's never been a refinery built. So um, super easy. Um, you know, we, we did two plays and chips. You know, we didn't, we, we didn't really get involved and get caught up in the chaos in the summer. But we had two plays and chips that have done well. And um so this is just a trustee mindset. You know, it's like, this is a time where you, you want to own some stuff, you know, you want to own some stuff and uh, it's not like you want to be all cash, um, but you're, you're, you don't want to, you don't want to be in things that are high, high risk, things that are highly exposed to what we're talking about. You don't want to be in that. It's not time for them. They're going to have to, they're going to have to issue more stocks. They're going to have to do all this crazy stuff. And you just don't, you, you're going to get, the odds of getting hurt are higher than the odds of, of having some big, speculative boom i mean in vancouver how many speculative pops are you having zero talk to the brokers they're they're all you know actually spending time with their families i mean <laughs> it's, it's like yeah, there's, there's no there's no action right now there's no action no it's a it's a yeah. tight game right now in the Vancouver. so if you're looking for action sure. that's the thing i try to tell people like you're looking for action what are you doing mm. there's no action it's mm-hmm. so an empty stadium mm. I like that, man. So quit, quit, quit buying tickets. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's like, yeah. Walk, walk my audience through the, 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 um, uh, T I'm just your letter EB. Yes. EB Tucker.com. That's right. Yeah. EB Tucker.com. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you yeah. know, it's, it's, and by the way, it's free. I mean, you can, you know, you and I share a common appreciation for people that are learning. Because that, that was us, that was us at one point. And uh, I know you. I know all those books behind you. You read all those books, and and uh, um, and you didn't do it because you were just studious. You know, you did it to learn. And so, you know, the the newsletter's free, and uh, there's eventually a paywall. You know, so when once you learn enough that you can make some money, then you can read the the end of it. But you can also read stories every other Thursday. It comes out. There's every no Thursday. marketing, by the way. There's no marketing. Every other Thursday, at 9 a.m. Eastern time, you get an email from me that's a letter that I write. There's no other employees. That's it. It's mm-hmm. me. This is my therapy. People need to understand that. This is this is this is me. This is how I see the world. 
This is what I enjoy doing. Um, there's nothing to sell you. There's no, I mean, there is subscription, but not, you know, you, you can choose on that, but there's not like hot stocks or something. It's not like that. This is, this is, you want to get inside my brain. This is how you do it. And, uh, and I enjoy it. You know, if, if you didn't read, I wouldn't write. You see how it goes? This is how I symbiotic people need to team to know that, that I do this because I don't have any choice. You know, this is, this is, you know, this is what I do. And I used to work for a big publisher and used to do all this different stuff. And I, I don't think people know what I do. I mean, they think that I'm the CEO of a royalty company. It's not true. Uh, I've been a director of a royalty company before and, um, you know, that's, that's very different from being an executive, you know, and if people would stop voting for me and electing me, I could retire from that and focus on what I really want to do, which is write, write my newsletter. And, um, you know, in 2024, by the way, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big goal setter, you know that. And, uh, I've been thinking about, you know, what I want to do in 2024, I'm going to do, I'm going to do more of the things I enjoy, Jay, and I'm going to do less of the things that I don't enjoy. All right. <laughs> so, uh, and I, and I think everybody should think about that concept, you know, because when you enjoy, when you do things you enjoy, you know, you, you, that joy shows and, um, it's so easy to do that. You just have to put a little bit of thought into it. Make a list. I make a bunch of list of it. What are the things that annoy me? You know, and you start cutting them, you know, getting, you getting, getting rid of those things. I like that, man. Okay. ebtucker.com. Check it out every second Thursday. It's great. By the way, writing's amazing. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. It's really important to find educators that entertain you because if you don't enjoy the process, you're not going to keep going back. Right. Like, you know, right. It's it's not like you find the letter that has this data point that no other letters have. It doesn't work like that. You got to find the delivery mechanism that you enjoy consuming, so you'll go back every time it's available, and that's how. Yeah, and, and you you know what the deal is is people don't understand is that, is that over time I'm going to teach you how how I think. That's that's the secret. Right. I mean, you're gonna if you read for a while, you're gonna be like you're gonna you're gonna start seeing these things that I see. I'm going to tell you everything. Like I'm going to tell you exactly what I do all the time. I mean, I'm going to tell you from how I make a coffee to how I decide what I'm going to buy to how I decide when I'm going to sell everything. I mean, it's not a secret code. It's it, 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 I've been doing this for so long and it's the, it's the habits. It's the habits. It's like health. Like you don't just take a supplement and you change your body. It's the yeah. habits that you have. That's, okay. that's why you, end up at a certain point and you're either healthier or wealthier or wiser or happier it's because of your habits and so i try to tell people that you just i'm gonna give it all away love that man okay, question buddy. is will you will you use it that's the question right well most won't <laughs> that's yeah, the thing that's right, right? You, you know, yeah you go to yeah. uh like you got a picture of yourself and tony robbins behind you there yeah and, Brian I, you know, Tracy, by the way, Brian Tracy is above. I don't know if you can see Brian Tracy, but psychology of a, that guy's from Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Originally, yeah, he's yeah, from Vancouver. Yeah. This guy is no single. He's still alive, so maybe he's watching. No single piece of material changed my life more than the psychology of achievement. Love that. Somebody yeah. gave it to me. Somebody gave me a bootlegged cassette copy of it six cassettes way back in the day a long time ago when people still had cassettes okay and i subsequently bought a lot of copies i felt bad because it, somebody given it to me they dubbed it but that was the biggest thing and i and i took a picture with him and i and i sent it to him and, and it says on your eb congratulations on your success you're the best and it's been hanging in my office you know ever since and and um but really he's the best okay it's not me you know, that, 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 that was the most, somebody gave that to me at a time when, when supercharged, it supercharged my, my life. Well, that's, that is, that is, that makes you an outlier. If you consume the content and the education material, but then you action it, right? Because, and I think this might've been Tony Robbins, who I heard in an interview and he's like, I'm going to tell you some things. You're going to agree with what I have to say. You're going to know that I'm right. You're going to believe that this can change your life. And then you're going to leave and do nothing with it, <laughs> which yep. is like probably 95% of the room in any of those scenarios. Uh, okay, man. Well, don't be that percent. Cool. Be the be the 5%. I appreciate you, EB. Thanks for coming on the show, man. This was great. I, I love seeing you and I hope to see you in person soon.
Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you wanna take the next step, I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video and you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.